Thank you so much, Miko and Sami, for being here with me today. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about a few things during our discussion, and of course, it can be a going back and forth. First of all, the lived experience um, that's unique to you both and how that led you into the remarkable pro-Palestinian activism and work that you do. And uh, related to that, the role that fear, um, as you see it, uh, plays in sustaining Zionism. And finally, how that might be challenged through solidarity efforts as you've undertaken them. And uh, at the same time, um, ones that bring together people from a wide range of backgrounds, um, ethnicities, religions, and so forth. So, Miko, I was thinking of starting off uh, with asking you, to your credit, you've been very honest in your own work, in your writing, for example, in The General Sun, about having to grapple with fears that initially you didn't know were there uh, with respect to the Palestinian people. Um, so I'm wondering whether you can comment on that and generally what you believe um, the role of fear might be in what you can describe as a, or one might want to describe as a Zionist upbringing. Well, first of all, thank you for, you know, for inviting me and for doing this interview. And I want to thank Dr. Sami. It's an honor to sit here next to him. I've, I've, been, I've admired him for many, many years. And so it's a great honor for me. Um, the role of fear, well, you can't really have, you can't really sustain racism and the kind of violence that's perpetrated against Palestinians without fear. I mean, fear is the foundation. Uh, fear and mistrust are really the foundation. And so um, when you look back, it's always little things, you know. I, when, I, when I was growing up, I, you know, growing up in Jerusalem, there was no wall, there were no checkpoints. But you wouldn't dream of going into a Palestinian neighborhood in Jerusalem. You wouldn't dream of it. Because the, these walls and checkpoints that were built inside your head over just, through, I don't even know how, I can't even put my finger on it, but through conversations, the things you hear at home, things you see at school, in the media, you know, as you grow up, it's just, you don't do it, you know it's dangerous. And the other, the otherness of the other, the danger of the other, the fear of the other is very intense, even though at the time you don't realize it. When I was finally confronted with this fear, when I began this journey as an Israeli into Palestine, then being an Israeli going into, Palest into, into the Palestine part of the country, it was madness. I mean, rationally, if I thought about it, it was madness. Even though I didn't realize I had any fears, rationally, it, would see, it seemed like it was madness. And then as I was driving to different places, and like you said, I described in the book, suddenly these demons, this fear just floods forward into your head and it just you know, takes over. But you couldn't possibly maintain the kind of oppression, the kind of violence that Israel maintains over Palestinians without embedding that fear just really, really fundamentally in, in a most profound way in Israelis. It could never, it would never work. Fear and mistrust uh, would never work without it. So, Sammy, related to that, I'm wondering whether in your own experience when you were doing such commendable work to um, help charities and so forth that were aiding the Palestinian people in the U.S. Um, and being persecuted for that, uh, whether you were experiencing um, that as being from a group that was fearful or hateful or some combination of both. Thank you also for inviting me and for being next to Miko. I, I wouldn't characterize it as fear. I mean, growing up was always the feeling of... Uh, frustration, being stateless, a bit anger, frustrated. And I'd say that uh, there's an unknown fear, you know. So it's not fear in the classical meaning of that word. It's just maybe the fear of the unknown because you've always been oppressed. You know, you always didn't know what the future holds for you. You're always in a country that you don't feel it's your own country. You're not a citizen, so you're denied many rights. I grew up in, I was born in Kuwait, grew up in Egypt, I always had that feeling. I had to go from space to place to place. Eventually, I went to the United States for my undergraduate and graduate degrees. I was 17. So there was suddenly a place where I wasn't looked at as a Palestinian or as the other, as the foreign. Okay, I was a foreigner, but still in the United States, you could, you could uh, hold your own and you can get to a place where 
you could be recognized for who you are as a person rather than as being a Palestinian or a stateless. But up to a point, once I started being very active on the Palestinian, then uh, the Zionists started picking on me and making my life difficult, you know, in all sorts of ways. Until eventually we got to the point where um, my job was threatened. I was suspended for many years, even though they couldn't fire me because I was tenured professor. And when they really pushed hard after 9-11, uh, I became a struggle. You know, either I can stay in the university if they're going to hold all the rules, you know, the academic rules and, and, and the values that the society holds, or they're going to bend the rules and try to figure out of a way to get rid of me. It was all about whether I'm going to stay in the university or not, and because I, I kept fighting. You know, I never uh, gave up, and I didn't bend. So, so eventually they, uh, they, they had a, a case that was a bloated case. You know, they were asking for three life sentences plus uh, 220 years. So I was facing basically literally the end of any civil life. You know, I was going to end up in prison for, for life. And I had to fight it, certainly. And uh, the, many things happened. And, you know, it ended up, fortunately for me, that I was not uh, convicted or sentenced to what they wanted to do with me, unlike hundreds of others who actually were as lucky. But the word fear, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't fear. But certainly there was anger, frustration, uh, feeling of oppression and where you're trying to fight it. So you have this this fighting spirit into uh, into this uh, atmosphere and, and that's what you're you know hoping that uh, your determination, your faith in, in justice, your faith that you are on the right, you have the truth, that this will prevail. But if it doesn't then I'm just one of the other <clears throat> You know, hundreds of thousands and millions of other Palestinians who uh, also had to fight and uh, sacrifice. Thank you. And Mikro, I'm wondering at what point, I know you've talked about this quite a bit already uh, publicly, at what point you were able to overcome these fears and engage in pro-Palestinian activism in earnest, and perhaps maybe comment on um, to what extent you feel that fear, as it's imposed by the Zionist regime, is preventing others from engaging in any kind of pro-Palestinian activism, whether Israeli or not Israeli. The, str you know, the constant struggle is fear and trust, fear and trust, fear and trust. That's a struggle. And so at some point, uh, and I could probably put my finger on that point, I just had to hold on to trust, you know, with everything I had so that the fear wouldn't make me just turn, turn away and run the other way. And that's the struggle, that was the struggle. And the more you allow trust, the, the more the fear is diminished. And so, you know, I describe, I describe in the general sound, the first time I drove to uh, the West Bank, in the West Bank by myself in a car. So I'm easily identifiable as an Israeli, I've got an Israeli license plate, it's a rented car, and I'm driving to meet activists in, in the West Bank in Belém. Is 2005, and that was there were moments there where I thought this is insane. I need to turn around and go back. This is too dangerous. And every time I saw somebody on the road, and it's a beautiful winding, you know, kind of country road, but it was full of you know red flags. And I had to trust that the people I was meeting and the people that told me they were waiting for me, I didn't know exactly where, but you know, down the road somewhere as I was driving. But I just had to trust them and, and I had to make a ch it was just a choice. But the desire to turn back was powerful. And so, but then, you know, I didn't and I let the, you know, trust take over and I met these people and I created a relationship and I spent time with them. And then there was another experience and another experience and another experience. And gradually the trust, you know, becomes a more dominant factor and the fear is diminished. And now the th for reasons that I'm not sure I can explain, I did have a degree enough of trust where I could hold on to it as I was going through this. Um, but Israelis don't have that because how could you possibly trust an Arab? You know, you'd have to be crazy to trust an Arab. And again, this is a time where there were no, before there were checkpoints and the wall wasn't built and, 
Uh, and then gradually after that, you know, there were more and more checkpoints. The wall was built. There's big signs that say to the warn Israelis that as you enter into Palestinian controlled areas, <laughs> big quotation marks, because nothing is controlled by Palestinians, uh, you're risking your life and you're committing a, you know, committing a felony and on and on and on. It's right there, these big signs, and you see these checkpoints and you see the traffic and you see all these Arabs. Well, you've got to be insane. How, why would you put yourself in this death trap? So as an Israeli, there's no way that you could possibly overcome that fear unless you're a little crazy or you find some reason to, 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 to go ahead and do it and trust somebody or something. And uh, Sami, so much of your own work in activism uh, centers around education. I'm wondering how you see uh, the role of education in dispelling some of the myths that we were just talking about. Um, some of these sorts of fears and uh, the hateful attitudes that uh, there exists in Israel, but also throughout the world, where there is this animus against the Palestinian people. My activism started in the United States. You know, I was there at a very young age. I went to the U.S. at the age of 17, and I started, you know, going to uh, school there, undergraduate, then graduate, and you could see that the other point of view is not even expressed. It's not even, didn't even exist when I went there first, 75, and throughout the next 10 years or so, there was a little bit of Palestinian voices, but not much. That mostly there is one narrative that is being given, not only publicly or the news outlets or even by the politicians, but even within academia. Um, Sometimes you you'll, you'll, you will see someone who may express some sympathy, but overall there wasn't. So it was imperative that we start telling the other point, especially when you lived it. You know, someone uh, like me who lived in a household of Palestinian refugees who were expelled from Palestine in '48. So I lived with these memories, with these stories, hearing it from my grandfather, two of my grandfathers, my grandmother and my parents. So, you know, the real story and also from their friends. I mean, when I was young, whenever there was any kind of visits coming to our house, the talk was always Palestine. It's always about what happened and what's going to happen and what's happening. I mean, it's always like that. So you live with that. In addition to the experience, I mean, you're reminded, it's not like you're a refugee, Syrian refugee coming to Turkey and living like Turks. No, you live this thing every single day. You're reminded of it, you know, doesn't matter whether in refugee camp in Lebanon, Syria and Jordan or in the West Bank and Gaza or even outside because of the way these societies are structured. You're reminded of the fact that you are Palestinian, you're different. Egypt was a bit different in the 60s, but once Sadat came to power, it was the, the, the somehow the state was structured also that you're different. And that's why I ended up in the United States, because I couldn't get to the college of my choice, even though I had the grades like Egyptians, because I was Palestinian. So eventually I went to the United States. Now we go there and you see, OK, I mean, obviously, the United States has a huge role that it's, it's playing and it's been played uh, in this conflict. It's not a neutral. It's not a uh, bystander. It's not uh, an honest broker. It's part of the problem. And unless the American people, you feel, and society at large uh, is aware of this, uh, this conflict will go forever. You know, uh, so we, I started, you know, basically within campuses and then you widen it to other communities, um, churches, even synagogues. I've been to many synagogues talking to liberal Jews, you know, and... Um, uh, and then you, you have friends within academia, and then you have both academic and public conferences. So after a while, you get known. And once you get known, you start, you know, being invited to too many campuses. And that's the way it was for me starting. I think my first, if I remember correctly, was in the aftermath of the Lebanese war. Actually, before, actually, before, a few months before that, you know, University of Michigan. And then, you know, almost other campuses, every other campus, main campus I've been to. And then you start talking and engaging, and then you find, okay, this is not enough. You really need to start grassroots. So I established several organizations that focus on Palestine. Then you see that that's even not enough, because even the little 
contributions you make in terms of engaging, uh, you need some political uh, work. You know, I wouldn't call it lobbying because lobbying is really a different word and it needs some professionals, but at least get engaged with politicians, with public persons, where these are the people who are actually making policies. These are the people who are actually aiding Israel in its occupation and its oppression of Palestinian people. So you start reaching out and trying, you know, bit by bit. You know, I had several experiences by which I was able to get into some of these politicians and I was amazed, really amazed, how they tell you something in private and completely the opposite in public. I had the head of the International Relations Committee at the time, someone who struck me, I mean, he was in public extremely pro-Israel, but in private so anti-Semitic. It just, I, I was stunned. And he thought that because, you know, I, you know, I, I oppose Israel vehemently that somehow I'm anti-Jewish. But the way he talked, it was, uh, you know, these people really have different mentality, different frame, you know, frame of mind. And then he told me, why shouldn't Palestinians have a state? They should have a state. This was a Republican, very well known from Chicago, Henry Hyde. Then he tells me, you know, I'm, next year I'm become the chairman of the International Relations Committee. And then once he became the chairman of the International Relations Committee, he was totally opposed to the Palestinian state and he was doing all this. It's all about power. So you find out that this is also not about awareness, uh, but also about power and the balance of power between two communities, one that is totally disenfranchised and one that is, has all the levers of power. So you become aware that this is not just about spreading awareness or telling people what this is about, which we spend a lot of time doing. And as I think you both allude so well, that you're doing your activism and your work in contexts that are particularly hostile to pro-Palestinian activism whether it's in the United States or Israel, these are very hostile contexts. So I wonder if you can shed some light on uh, from what you draw your strength, how you've been able to be so tenacious throughout all these years. Uh, I think that could be maybe helpful to some of the uh, younger people now who are, are engaging for the first time in pro-Palestinian activism. I can tell about my experience uh, being in prison. Uh, there were three sources of strength for me. First and foremost, you know, I was religious, but not fanatic. I mean, I have real faith that this word at the end, uh, that there is a God and that God is a source of strength for me. And sometimes you feel that when you are against odds that are very difficult to justify logically or rationally, they say you can't win against it. So you have to rely on that. So that's a big source of strength for me. Uh, and certainly helped me throughout my ordeal. You know, I stayed almost five and a half years in prison, almost six years under house arrest. So you have to have an anchor. But also the the uh, the, the love and, and support of my family uh, has been phenomenal for me. That played a huge role. You know, my wife and my children and those who are close to us. And, and that also is a source of strength, but also the strength the feeling that you are on a just cause. This is not something that you know, you're trying to gain you know, either in status or in, or, or in fortune or, or something to gain personal gain. You know, it would have been much easier for me had I forsaken you know, this cause. I, I could have gone to many, many positions and, and status of wealth and others. No, this was a case that I deeply believed in and I thought it is incumbent upon me because I was so fortunate as a Palestinian to, to reach that status, you know, to be a professor and, and you have all these things around you where millions of Palestinians have been deprived of that. So it was to me a sense of duty to do something about this, even in small, small ways. And I, I, but uh, that, that belief also sustains you that, you, 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 don't, you know, you didn't cheat people. I didn't kill people, I didn't maim people. That's what they were trying to portray you as. You know, it's, I, I, and they couldn't even take, uh, uh, charge me with this. So what they did is they charged me with conspiracies. When they have no things against you, what do they do? They charge you with conspiracy, right? So during the conspiracy, they have to bring all kinds of charges. They call it predicates, you know, so that they say, okay, it's a conspiracy to do something, right? So one of the charges, it's interesting enough, they said extortion. So one of our lawyers said, what do you mean extortion? Who were they trying to extort? And the government's answer was very interesting. They say he was trying to extort land from the state of Israel. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh. 
then the judge says, come on. I mean, you can't extort an entity or a state. You have to extort a person. So they took it out. They didn't need it because they had nine crimes. They only needed one. So they superseded and put it back in. And I'm trying to see who the heck did I extort? And during the trial, they brought an Israeli woman who testified. She came from Costa Rica and she testified during the trial that in 1996, she lost a sister in Tel Aviv to a suicide bomber. And she felt so afraid that four years later, she had to sell her restaurant in Tel Aviv and move to Costa Rica with her husband and two children. And this is how I, sitting in Florida, extorted her. That's the extent <laughs> that they had to go through. So, you, you, you know, during this whole ordeal, you know, you're saying, okay, this came 2003, the trial was 2005. You have all these charges. We had over 100 charges against the four defendants. And you say, okay, how am I going to defend against this? If you didn't have faith, you'll go crazy. And they were trying to put all the pressure on you to plead something. And they wanted you to plead so you can go life instead of three life sentences. So crazy. But at the end of the day, you know, you didn't do anything wrong. And you, you believe strongly in the, in the truthfulness of your case, in the correctness of your case, in the justness of this case. And therefore, whatever happens, happens. And, you know, lo and behold, you know, they don't convert on a single crime. So that gives you even more faith in, in what you're doing. Certainly. And what about yourself, Beko? I mean, where do you draw strength from in face of all this opposition? Probably the primary source of, of strength for me and inspiration are my Palestinian brothers and sisters. Um, I mean, Dr. Sami is one example, but, you know, I, I, we can sit here all night and talk about all of the incredible people that I've met and that I know intimately, uh, Palestinians who have gone through hell and back. Um, lost loved ones, <clears throat> spent time in jail, and on and on and on. And it wouldn't even begin to occur to them to lose hope or to stop struggling or, you know, people who's, who, you know, who lost children or his, his children have been injured by this. And I mean, they wouldn't dream of, of stopping the struggle, ending the struggle, because it's a just struggle. So to me, that's the, the primary source of, source of inspiration. I just want to add one thing, because what Miko said is, is absolutely true. One difference between my case and the other cases in which hundreds of people basically ended up behind bars and convicted even though they're innocent, like the Holy Land Five, in which he wrote a book, very nice book, very good book about it. In my case, I had a lot of connections with non-Muslims, with people who were just regular Americans, you know, Christian Americans, Jewish Americans, and others, and who stood behind my case. That also was a source of strength. You know, I remember that Many of my fellow Muslims abandoned us, the family and me, because of the fear. How they installed fear in them, the FBI and others. But the others who didn't care, they were there on the, in, in the courtroom, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the footsteps of, of the court every single day. The jury said, okay, this is not his community and they are here every day. There must be something fishy here. So that also to us, that solidarity that existed is a huge source of strength. Uh, for me personally and also for the cause in general. And that's what we see today, you know, with, with, the, with the thousands of Palestinians being killed. There are more people around the world who demonstrate every single day and do so many things than people, unfortunately, in the Arab and Muslim capitals. Thank you for your candidness about your own lived experience in life. Um, it was very reassuring to me because as I was preparing this interview, I was wondering, can I, can I go that far or are they going to be okay with that. <laughs> so thank you for um, engaging with me on, on points of your life um, uh, that, uh, that were obviously not easy. So um, perhaps we can start with you, Miko. Any final thoughts or observations that you'd like to share? Let's see. Well, first of all, I think that people need to realize that the struggle for justice in Palestine is a struggle that we're all going to be judged on. Our kids, our grandkids are going to ask us, where were you? How did, did you let this happen? You know, our, our integrity, our legacy, our, our, who we are, you know, is, is defined by where we stand on this. And um, I, I know what I want my kids to think. And I, I, know, I know what my, my grandkids one day, I, I know what I want them to think. And, and I want to be proud of the fact that I stood on the right side. But this is also a call, you know, it's a call to action and it's a warning. You know, we've had cases in history and people have invoked the Holocaust and the fact that Jews were being slaughtered, rounded up and slaughtered uh, and the world was silent. And now 
Um, well, it didn't happen yesterday. It didn't happen October 7th. Three years after the end of the Holocaust, the world allowed another genocide to begin in Palestine. Three years after the, the end of, of the genocide of the Jews in Europe, the world allowed the genocide of the Palestinian people to commence in Palestine, very close to Europe, <clears throat> excuse me, by mostly European Jews, mostly Europeans, you know, by Zionists. So I think it should give people pause. You know, we can't let this go on any longer. You know, Palestinians are, to a large degree, like prisoners in a, in, a, in a maximum security prison. They're doing everything they can, above and beyond, in terms of sacrifice and courage and resistance. And I don't, don't just mean armed resistance, I mean all forms of resistance that Palestinians have been engaged in. And they're being punished heavily, heavily, regardless of what they do. We need to step up. We need to step up. We need to say sanctions and an embargo on weapons right now, a no-fly zone on Gaza right now, and end of trade and closing embassies right now. And unless we demand this of our governments, they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it unless the constituents demand it in every single country and every single government. We need to step up and act. And then, you know, this is our, our legacy, our integrity. How dare we allow this to happen on our watch? So I think it's important for people to, you know, take this in. And what about yourself? Some people may see this as a very dark moment in the history of the struggle or being pessimistic or things are bleak. But I also think this is a juncture by which I think we are approaching the time where the whole Zionist enterprise, I think, is in jeopardy of disintegrating. It's going to take a long effort. But I think we are going to get there. A lot of people, when you talk to them before what happened, before they see for themselves what Zionism is capable of transforming certain people to becoming basically savages, and, and, and that this whole ideology that you were talking about before, that people don't believe exactly what they're capable of, but once they saw it themselves and experienced it, I think a lot of people now came to the conclusion that this could not be the future what happens in historical Palestine, that there has to end. There has to be uh, dismantlement of this system. This system does not recognize but one group of people. And for it to uh, carry the day, that means they have to basically obliterate uh, the other people who are today actually majority, even though a majority of Palestinians are outside Palestine, but even in Palestine, the majority are Palestinians and Arabs. So they have to face either uh, Zionism will carry the day by which they will have to continue this until they uh, uh, um, kill basically every Palestinian, which I think is not going to happen and cannot happen and the world will not let it happen even if they killed thousands and thousands of Palestinians now or things would have to change in the right direction. That's going to take a lot of effort, a lot of struggle. It's going to take you know, the whole world to come together in solidarity, particularly those who value these uh, you know, the, 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 these concepts, these values, and then we will win the day. It's going to take a while, but I believe uh, it's not going to take more than a generation uh, for this to happen. So I would like to end on this optimistic, even though we see a lot of blood and a lot of uh, 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 misery and a lot of suffering. But I think these people have not suffered in vain, that eventually it, those who are on the on, 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 on the side of the Palestinians, on the side of just, on the side of, of, of truth will prevail. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Sami and Miko, for this illuminating discussion. We're joining TRT World today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.